I guess the advice I would have for either young folks starting in or people who have been teaching a certain way and then moving to a new approach is not to try to do it all at once. When people are first getting started with active learning, I recommend that they pick a really finite thing to focus on. So maybe one concept that's particularly difficult, one unit that lends itself nicely to case study teaching or problem-based learning, and just focus on that rather than redesigning their whole course. What happens is people hear about active learning and all these great techniques and it works in classrooms and they try to just pile it all on at the same time and then get overwhelmed and don't continue. So just try one technique or one idea and don't feel um, discouraged, I guess, if it, if it doesn't work the first time, because most things I try the first time don't work. <laughs> Maybe not even the second time. Another thing that I hope my colleagues do, because it really made a big impact on me, is to just go watch faculty do what they do, because I didn't understand the scope of the difference. More than likely, you'll see that there are lots of really fantastic teachers at your institution, um, but they're all different. Each person has their own teaching style. Each person comes to it in their own way. So the most useful thing for me in learning how to teach using active learning strategies was to actually teach with someone who was knowledgeable about active learning. I co-teach a class with Peggy Brickman at the University of Georgia. We teach a, an introductory non-majors biology class. And she comes and sits in, in my class sessions. And it's enormously useful. What she does is she focuses not on what content I'm covering or evaluating me, but on what students are doing. So that when we talk after class, she can say, OK, students were able to do this, but they weren't able to do this. So what can we change about the way that we're teaching that gets them to do what we want them to do? My actual first attempt at problem-based learning was in a large enrollment classroom with a um, sort of like an amphitheater type of setting with uh, tiered seating and fixed seats with pads and, uh, and all of that. So the advice I got was if your class doesn't fill the room, so get a room that's bigger than what you really need and leave um, every second row empty so that um, you can walk down the row and have access then to the groups. And then the groups would be the students in the first row and the students in the second row and they turn around and then can have a conversation. So that can work and that's what I did originally. I had 630 students in a lecture hall. They self-assembled self into teams and each team when they came in, they had to check in the back of the room. There would be a whole series of file folders and a box of clickers, several boxes of clickers. The folder might have some complicated multiple choice questions in there, or it could have uh, questions that required solving, solving something so there'd be a, a numerical answer. There's kind of a limit to what you can do with most clicker systems. And during the, the course of the class, there'd be times when I'd ask them questions and ask them to weigh in with a clicker as a way of finding out where the class was. Did they understand the concepts that we were just going through? So one of the changes in thinking that I think has to happen with faculty is to think very carefully about, I have 50 minutes with these students, or I have 90 minutes with these students. How can I spend that time most effectively to get them to the ideas I want them to get them to? And sometimes that means I need two pair shares here, or I need a case study discussion, or I need to show three examples from that homework that nobody was able to do, and we need to critically evaluate how we can improve that. What I would do when I was first teaching uh, biology classes was I literally had a list of sort of my toolbox of active learning strategies and other strategies. And I, by list, I literally mean like written on a sheet of paper or on a post-it or something on my computer or something. And as I was looking over the course calendar and looking over the content for the quarter or the semester, I would look through and think about, OK, where could I plug in some of those ideas? You know, if you only teach in one way, I think that that one way is going to be best for certain students. And so the other way I think about equity is really variety. So I don't always 
teach with one thing. So the think pair share, I don't always do think pair share, but it is a, a tool that comes up frequently. Uh, have that background yourself that, you know, I know why I'm doing this, I know what my goals are for this, and I can even express those to students when we try this out. Um, so I think bringing students into that equation is really helpful and not, not hiding the fact that you're trying something new, um, while at the same time not being nervous about it and like, hey, this might crash and burn, but being able to tell students like, hey, I'm really excited, uh, we're going to try something different today to try to learn this topic, and uh, I'm really excited to hear what you get out of this because these, these are the goals that I hope you'll get at the end of this and that I'm going to be looking for, and uh, I'll be really excited to get your feedback as well to see how you learn through this project or through this activity. Some people will say that in, in your early tenure years, that's a bad idea. But everybody tells you, your first year, they tell you when you start, your first year will not be good. So you might as well do, try a bunch of crazy things. Maybe somebody will learn something. <laughs>